Welcome to today's webinar, Building Brazometer's Unique Technology and Culture. Our CTO tells all. Before we get started, I wanted to go over a couple of housekeeping items. Today's session will be recorded and emailed to you afterwards. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. To ask questions, please use the Q&A panel that can be found when you click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. For those of you who are at your first time, my name is Roni Margulies, and I will be your moderator on today's webinar. On today's agenda, why recruiting the right people and positive company culture are the preconditions to the successes of any high-tech company. Challenges faced by small multidisciplinary R&D teams tasked with corporate-sized data issues. When you are limited by cost and time, how can you digest and analyze terabytes of data while also considering performance? Delivering value to customers rather than dealing with DevOps, maintenance, and scaling issues. And of course, your questions. Today's webinar will be hosted by our co-founder and CTO, Emil Fisher. Emil has a BSc in software engineering from the Technion with years of experience in high tech and major defense projects. Emil is an expert in software developing management methodologies and techniques, an entrepreneur at heart and at practice, and one of our founding fathers. If it's your first time joining us today, Brazometer is a big data company that provides actionable personalized data for air quality, pollen, weather, and fires to businesses from numerous industries as well as governments. Take it away, Emil. Hi, Ronit. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for the, the warm, warm welcoming and in the, in the introduction. It is great to be here with you and the listeners. Thank you all for joining us. Joining us. So, actually, I'm an entrepreneur in my nature. I, uh, I always wanted to invent new gadgets and software and, and change the world. And uh, this, this was my passion since, actually, since I was a child. But uh, let's uh, get back to reality. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's a good picture. That represents everything. Talk to us about this time, Emil. <laughs> <laughs> so before establishing Brizometer, I was uh, different times. I was working uh, in a place with a bad culture environment, where an employee was just a worker bee, where the words and ideas uh, were often muted by force or uh, by fear, and uh, staying uh, comfortable was the underlying conversation between workers and I was supposed to get my tenure as well. I, I, I remember that I felt stuck and I knew it wasn't enough. And I felt like this is my actually last chance to be, to be what I want, an entrepreneur. Yet. <laughs> yeah. But. but. But still, actually, if I go back in time, it was a hard decision for me to leave my company and establish the presumptory. Uh, I think of, of, of that time where, where it, it was scary. My wife, she was, she was pregnant and I was about to get my tenure, as I mentioned. Uh, we were looking for a house to buy and uh, we had the financial obligations like my wife that was uh, in the middle of her second degree. So it was very hard. It was a very hard decision. Uh, but it was then uh, the run, my best friend in the last 21 years, and today uh, Brizometer CEO, approached me with an idea that answered actually to all key elements missing in my career path back, day, back in the days. Uh, according to the World Health Organization, air pollution is the 21st century epidemic, and according to the EEA, the European Environmental Agency, air pollution is currently the most important environmental risk to human health. Uh, the idea was to make the environmental data like air pollution, but not only visible. It was a, it was a project that I uh, could believe in strongly. 
a space to be creative, to build something significant for the society, uh, to, do it, to do it from scratch. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, to invent things and change the world. And, and that I would be able to establish a startup that puts focus on the right culture and celebrates its employees. And it would be their contribution and the culture that would be the secret sauce to the success of the company. I have to say, I mean, it's an ambitious goal, but I mean, here we are years down the line and, and the dream was realized. And I can say actually personally as part of the team that I'm grateful that this was your strategy for success. But I, I mean, our listeners, like, I don't think that they're going to buy that this was a straight line to success. We're talking about a startup that had, that was taking on a big data task in a field that was only emerging and actually pretty dependent on how many consumers really cared about air pollution. Yeah, so there are, uh, as you mentioned, there are many challenges. In, Just a few. And even, and even more. Uh, and this is one of the things that makes Brizometer unique. Uh, I can name several challenges, but uh, it's, it's a short list. Uh, <laughs> but actually, there are so many challenges. Uh, we need to raise the awareness about, for example, about air pollution uh, and, and, uh, what, and what it makes and, and how harmful, harmful it is. We need to educate the market and educate the people because air pollution is invisible and it's hard to fight an invisible enemy. And sometimes you don't, you don't understand that the enemy is, is just next to you because it's invisible, but it, it uh, shortens your, your life. Uh, we need to, uh, we sell API, we sell data, we provide services. Uh, but if we focus on API, selling API is hard. And selling environmental data is even harder because it's a, it's a niche. Um, we also provide our data to many different business segments, uh, such as uh, pharmaceutical companies, automotive industry, smart cities, IoT, smart home devices, and many, many more, even cosmetics. And, uh, and it's, it's always hard to create products that speaks in, in, in a new language for different business segments uh, of what is their quality or what is, the, what, what is the pollen level at your location in real time. Because it, it's really it's something unique. It's something that has never, has never been done before. We also, we, we don't just provide data, we provide accurate data. So providing accurate data is, is a big challenge. It's not just garbage in, garbage in, garbage out. It's really accurate data, personalized data, and really democratize data at your location for you. We also need to deal with SLA, uh, performance, uh, big data problems. Uh, maybe we'll talk about it soon. Uh, and, and of course, to provide the environmental data, you need a strong multidisciplinary team of software engineers and environmental engineers and big data experts and machine learning experts and, and the atmospheric uh, scientists, algorithms and, and, and more. So they need to speak in one language, although each and every one of them studied something differently. We, we need to develop many products and all, we also need to provide our uh, products to, to consumers and businesses. Not an easy task. <laughs> Essentially, you're creating a possibility for people that don't know the possibility exists, people and businesses, within this multidisciplinary team and data. So, I mean, we're a technological company. Is technology the answer here? So many, many digital initiatives fail because of uh, an overemphasis on technology, and I'm the city of the company <laughs> saying that. <laughs> Uh, but today, technology for me is commodity, and uh, in most cases, star startups don't fail because of technology barriers. Technology alone would not be the, the means to our success. The biggest challenge for us, and I believe should be for any successful company, is, uh, is finding the best people. 
recruiting A players for Brizometer and I'm uh, highlighting A players for us because maybe there are other A players for other companies. I always like uh, to quote Guy Kawasaki, uh, was the chief evangelist uh, working with Steve Jobs twice. Before leaving Apple and after re returning to Apple, he said always hire A players uh, because if you will hire B players, then they will hire C players and you will end up with the Z players that will hire Bozos. <laughs> not you, <Scott. laughs> no. So we are not looking for mercenaries. We are looking for people to be part of our family. Uh, we are, we are uh, we're looking for people that they need to be connected to our, our agenda of, of improving the well-being of billions of people worldwide which are exposed to environmental hazards every single day. And they need to, to be connected with, to the agenda somehow. If it's, uh, for example, due to the freedom of information law, or if, if they want to do good, or uh, if, uh, if they want to leave uh, the world a better place to our children. So they need to be connected to our agenda. I can tell you, for example, that when I joined, I was looking for a way to make a difference. And all the, you know, these big um, ventures, these big ideas seemed too big for me to have an effect on the world. And this was something that I really connected to. Here, I was able to affect change via the work that I would be doing at Prisometer. Exactly. But as I mentioned, we are not looking for mercenaries. We're also looking for people that are passionate about what they're doing, people that, that their, their work is also their hobby. And this is, for me, this is very important. We're looking for people that are team players and because of the multidisciplinary team and multidisciplinary effort. We look for, for, for self-learners, people who are positive, but yet hum they are humble and people that that will go to a battle with us when needed. People that I can trust them to be there when is needed. And also, we don't like yes men. <laughs> we want people to challenge us and ask sometimes difficult questions. The, the team at Brizometer is extremely talented. They, they are being approached by the biggest and the, the most prestigious companies. So I believe we should put focus on the question, uh, what makes an A player to be happy and stay at Brizometer? So every day, again and again, they will continue to choose to stay at Brizometer uh, because uh, it should be a symbiotic relationship. Actually, yeah. each employee, for, for me, each employee needs to prove that he deserves to work at Brizometer, but uh, vice versa. Brizometer also should make sure he deserves to hire such talents. Yeah, so so if, if I'll focus on what makes an A player to be happy and stay, and this is something that uh, I thought about a lot in the last six years, and uh, and and I shorten my list to to the fo following uh, points. Uh, I I really believe that if you work with people that are also A players, so they also they teach you, they push you up, and uh, and it's a different uh, working environment rather than just working with uh, B players. I I want other people to teach me so they need to be a players uh, also if people feel that they are doing something that is actually is being part of something that is bigger than the new or, or the, the employee uh, for example you know that you have a global impact your your mission or your vision is is really changing the world and making the world a better place so so it will make, it will create a lot of motivation for employees. Also, of course, uh, I, I don't want people to be bored. So they need to be challenged in their domain and they need to see that their, their career is moving forward in, in their professional domain as, as expected. 
And also they need to feel that they, they are moving the needle. They are contributing significantly to the main effort and to the success of the, the company. Yeah, of course, also I believe that managers uh, is a crucial part of uh, happiness of, of employees together with the culture of the company. Things like uh, openness and being able to ask any question that uh, you want, being able to challenge your peers, etc. This is uh, this is, this is crucial. This is also why we believe in a uh, in a flat structure, not in, a, in not in pyramids like in other companies. So, who who are you in this cultural phenomenon that you successfully built? <laughs> I can speak for. <laughs> Uh, my, uh, so, I have a small role. It's, it's just to recruit. <laughs> <tiny one>. <laughs> <laughs> it's just to recruit the best people in each domain, uh, people that are better than me, uh, and make them happy and stay. Help them, show them uh, where they need to aim, uh, remove uh, obstacles, and make sure that uh, they are working on, on a meaningful task that will make a difference. Course. I don't want to people people just work on uh, on uh, things that uh, at the end will throw them away. Okay, so we have the team. The structure has been put into place for a culture to thrive, and and it thrives. But Emil, I mean, at the end of the day, the, the technology is still essential. I mean, terabytes of data, the limited team, the limited time, the limited funds, the promise of performance, coverage, accuracy, relevancy, stop me, please. Talk to us about the technology, Mr. CTO. <laughs> sounds, uh, <laughs> sounds really like fun. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're right, Renate. Uh, we, we use, first of all, we use many raw data layers. Many. Uh, I can name some. For example, we take uh, we take information from uh, official governmental monitoring stations that measure the concentrations of different uh, pollutant types, and we collect and and the data is out there. We rely heavily on the freedom of information law, but it's scattered across the web. We collect data only in this layer of monitoring stations. We collect data from hundreds of different data sources, and it's a and it's a headache. You need to scrape the data, to find it, to get a legal uh, uh, permission to access the data. You need to to build the scraper or the, the the crawler to collect the data. So this is only monitoring stations, and we take data also data from uh, traffic because uh, traffic, of course, uh, affects uh, the levels of air pollution. Uh, we take meteorological conditions. Of course, you, you don't need to be an environmental engineer to understand that wind affects dramatically how uh, air pollution uh, dispersed. Uh, we take uh, satellites information, and also we use uh, smoke from fires or fires layer, but we care about the smoke that coming from fires. Uh, as opposed to other uh, air quality data providers uh, that uh, just report the raw data from monitoring stations, we use all, all of the mentioned data layers that, uh, that I talked about a minute ago, uh, and we use it as a real-time input data sets that, uh, that uh, comes into our algorithms that uh, calculate environmental data at almost half a billion geographical locations around the world to provide personalized recommendations for, uh, for the best action to take according to your personal sensitivity and the air pollution outside. So, so actually to provide you the, the air pollution levels, uh, the pollen levels at your location, we need to calculate Really, the pollu their pollution and the pollen levels it it really all around 500 million geographical locations around the world. So yes, we also deal with uh, <laughs> as you understand with massive data loads, 
about petabytes uh, per month. It's, it's a lot of data, uh, even for big companies. And we have to be able to calculate billions of pollutants concentrations around the globe using our uh, complex algorithms, more than 35 algorithms. And we use uh, thousands of uh, virtual machines to, cal to calculate billions of pollutant pollutants concentrations. And we analyze almost uh, two terabytes of data each hour again and again. Yeah, it's, it's quite a lot. I think 10 years ago, it wasn't possible for, uh, for, uh, for even for big companies because it's, it's a lot of computing power and it costs a lot of money. And also, as you guys can see in the video that I'll start to play, in just one moment, the pollution changes. It just it and disperses at, at over the course of minutes and hours, over the course of the day, um, from one location to another. So I, I'll just take a stab in the dark on this one, Emil. But that must need a lot of computing power, all the while providing this data in real time. Not to mention doing so in dozens of countries in parallel. The, the pressure on our developers must be massive. Yeah, exactly. This forces us to be focused and efficient. And as a big data company, choosing the right cloud platform was extremely critical for us. After examining several solutions, we chose to work with GCP, Google Cloud Platform. It enables us to focus on delivering value to our customers rather than dealing with DevOps, maintenance, and scaling issues. GCP also provides us a technological peace of mind and enables, enables us to focus on the technological efforts on our critical challenges to keep uh, driving our business forward. And uh, I can, uh, if you want, I can share with you several examples on how exactly GCP does that. Please. Yeah, okay. So, uh, so uh, I can, we are we are uh, we are a big fan of uh, managed solutions because it saves a lot of time. We we don't just want to work with uh, a bare bone metal or just uh, just virtual machines, but rather we prefer platform as a service rather than just infrastructure. So Google's managed solutions has been a game changer for us. For example, thanks to App Engine uh, dealing with API queries is super dynamic. We don't have to worry about load, load balancing, uh, uh, operating systems, uh, scaling issues, server maintenance, and erratic, erratic load changes. We just deploy uh, our code and let Google handle everything else, which is great, especially for uh, small uh, teams or relatively small teams. Also, GCP is a sandbox for our uh, data scientists, uh, but not only our data scientists, also for our software engineers. Uh, GCP Data Studio and Data Lab uh, significantly reduced the cycle of de developing and deploying new algorithms. Also, for example, uh, back in the days, uh, our environmental engineers, they wrote code in MATLAB. And then software engineers had to shift that code into Python and then to deploy the code uh, to, the, to the operational environment. But actually, today, the environmental engineers, they write code. Uh, yeah, they write code in Python, in the cloud, they, they deploy the, their code uh, to the cloud, Amazing. which is really uh, mind-blowing. If, if you had... You, if you had asked me this question uh, six years ago, I would tell you that it would be a big challenge. But now it's reality. So, uh, so also uh, in our uh, in our vision, when you take your son and daughter to the park, or, or you are on your way to work, or uh, having dinner with your loved ones. You really know what you're breathing and how it impacts your health. So therefore, you, for such a responsibility, we had to choose the most scalable, flexible, and uh, innovative, innovative cloud platform. And I, I must say that uh, the fact that their uh, team is located in Israel 
and we work very closely with them, uh, made it much easier. So GCP was and still a, a great match for us. I want to just sum it up for everyone. Um, it, I sent um, an email today asking if you guys had any questions and somebody asked, um, what is your biggest asset? What, what, how would you answer that question? <laughs> I think uh, it won't be a surprise if I'll say that uh, <laughs> the biggest asset is not uh, the virtual machines or uh, the office uh, or the equipment, but just just the people, the really the A players that I mentioned. They are they are the secret sauce for the success of the company, and uh, and and all of our achievements is uh, is thanks to them. Amazing. Um, thank you so much, Emil. And um, we've come to the Q&A portion of the webinar. Please, everyone, feel free, send in your questions. Uh, we have time for a few. So um, I just want to, as you guys are sending in your questions, I want to answer one of the questions that was sent in uh, today from the email. How do you measure accuracy? Okay. So we have several uh, methods uh, to measure accuracy. First of all, uh, accuracy is a huge and a significant part in our uh, daily work. We, we are actually fanatic about it, really. Uh, <laughs> we, in our uh, TV screens, in our offices, uh, there are accuracy metrics <laughs> that are being shown to, to reflect the accuracy uh, each hour again and again we have a separate and isolated service that calculates our accuracy uh, for the last uh, hour of calculation uh, for, and we really have a lot of hundreds of different metrics about accuracy but regarding your question about the method i can mention one method but there are others uh, we we use the leave, leave one out uh, cross validation method to check our accuracy Let's, uh, let's assume that uh, the world consists of, of uh, tens of thousands of uh, sensors or monitors. The, each monitor monitors the concentration of different uh, pollutant type. So let's, let's talk about uh, ozone, okay? Uh, for example, what we do, uh, if we look at, at ozone, ozone, we, we take each, station and remove it from our main algorithms as if the station uh, wasn't there we calculate the the concentration of of ozone at the location of the station and then we compare it to the actual reading that the station reported retroactively after several hours because each station has also uh, inherent delay of reporting data. If, for example, you will check uh, for uh, stations uh, in, in the US, uh, you'll see a gap uh, between one, two, three hours of, of uh, delay in, in reporting uh, data. So, so we do it each hour for, for tens of thousands of monitors around the world. So we have a, a really good uh, understanding of our accuracy metrics because we do the leave one out uh, methodology for each monitor again and again each hour. Hope I answered your Great. question. Um, it's an important question, so I think it was good that we answered that in full. Um, By the way, not, another question is another method is also a temporal method. What I described now is a special method. It's a is how we measure our prediction in space. There are also uh, methods uh, that uh, check our accuracy in time. As I mentioned, station, stations, they have a delay. In, in some countries, the delay can uh, reach to more than five hours. So we don't care about the concentration levels of what happened five hours ago, because air pollution changes dramatically in space and time. I want to know what is the concentration of each pollutant type now. So we use also machine learning algorithms, but not only to predict 
what is the level of each pollutant concentration now. And then we, after several, hour, several hours, we compare the readings that we thought uh, versus the actual readings, readings that came after several hours. Hope, hope I answered your, your virtual question. <laughs> Thanks, Emil. Um, so we are short on time. Um, the questions that you sent in, we'll follow up with you tomorrow, as well as we'll share the recording. We talked about the technology. We talked about the culture. We showed you a bunch of pictures of our beautiful faces. Um, I just want to say again, thank you, Emil, for joining us. It was great. It was informative. Um, we talked about me crying. I think we reached that level. <laughs> thank you guys for joining us. Thank you for keeping for continuing to come back and um we will see you and, and thank you Ronit, for uh, hosting this webinar but not only this webinar and thank you for uh, initiating this great uh, effort of uh, webinars that uh, that really provide more insights and information to people outside the zoom but i wasn't gonna cry <laughs> <laughs> come back to our next one guys we'll see you have a good one. Bye, guys.